the meta ethics and the anthro non anthro um, distinctions that have informed so much of the first 20 or 30 years of environmental ethics, right? Um, he's criticizing the idea that uh, that that the work of environmental ethics consists of identifying those things which are which have moral status and then working somehow to protect them. And he says those are that's a good project, right? But we need to always remember that our work to protect wilderness, right? He's critical. He's critical of wilderness preservationism. And he's critical of species preservationism. Not those things per se. He thinks we should keep doing those things. We should keep doing wilderness preservation. We should keep doing species preservation. But we should do them with the understanding that the central work that we need to do involves reconnecting nature and culture. Okay? And to the extent that our emphasis on species preservation and wilderness preservation underscores a division between human beings and nature, right? Between culture and nature, then those kind of then they're wrong, right? I mean to the it, it, you know, right? And and so there's this very penetrating and, and deep criticism of much of 20th century North American environmentalism and its focus on wilderness preservation, its focus on preserving playgrounds for elitists to go play in, right? I mean, that's one criticism, right? That's the kind of criticism you might hear from a wise user, right? These people are just, right? They work extracting, exploiting natural, but then they, right, all week long, Monday through Friday, but they make a lot of money and they want to be able to go play in their little ecological playground, right? And so they want to preserve these places, national parks, et cetera, et cetera. But look at the places that they always focus on. They're places that are separate from, from culture, separate from, hum you know, they're remote, they're way out there. And nowadays especially, right, the, pre the urgent task for environmentalists is, is to clean up our air and our water, right? And to make our, our, our civilization sustainable, consistent with natural processes, right? Um, and so this focus on wilderness preservation, in a sense, is a distraction. It's a dangerous distraction, right? And again, this focus on species, that's good. But we need to be reminded at every stage that's, that every individual species is has, a, has habitat, really strong habitat needs, right? And so we shouldn't think of species as being isolated entities, unique unto themselves, right? We need to start thinking of restoring the whole tapestry right of nature and not just wilderness and species right and that's that's the basic point that, Dom, that Thomas Birch keeps getting at right and he thinks this emphasis on wilderness preservation and species preservation is rooted in this artificial eth ethic that is reflected in the work for example of Kalika and Rolston right and their insistence on trying to separate out that which has moral status from that which has not right Right, well, one of the sad consequences, it might, you might not see it as a consequence, but associated with wilderness preservation is exploitation and sacrifice of what is not in that designated wilderness area, right? All right, so Thomas Birch, he wants to step all the way back and ask about our moral obligations and, and where the sense of what we think of as moral obligation comes from. And, um, okay, so he reminds us that um, the word dion in Greek is often translated, and now you know you might have one step up on it if you take an ethics class from another professor. You might hear, hear it said that it's always, and I've done this in the past myself, Dion means duty, right? Dion is the Greek word for duty. I've said that to my students. It turns out that isn't true, actually. I don't know why. I don't know Greek. I don't know how to speak Greek, you know, so I didn't know that. But Thomas Birch straightens this out. It's kind of an important point, right? And you might say, well, the Kantians and their twisted reading of Dion and this notion of duty, they're, they're, they're articulating something, but it's not, it's not really what we experience. Right? We don't experience, duty is something abstract, we don't actually experience that. What we experience is this sense of, of what we must do. Right? You might think, well, how is that different than duty? Or isn't duty that what you must do? I don't know, but he's making an artful, and it seems to be an important point. All right? 
He argues that however rigorously and comprehensively we define the moral status of more than human entities, our emergent experience of that which we must do, right? this is his central point, our emergent experience of that which we must do, right? Emergent, there's ecology and biology coming up again, right? Shining some light on reality, and then with the shining of the light comes new <coughs> obligations, right? The more you know, the greater your obligations, right? Um, uh, but the problem is that, okay, no matter how rigorously and comprehensively we get with our theory, right, of moral status, of ecological wholes, our actual experience will always exceed our, our actual experience of that which we have some kind of obligations to, right, some kind of obligation to, will always exceed our definition. There will always be stuff that doesn't fit into our definition of what has moral status, right? There will always be stuff that exceeds our definition. That, that, that there, always, there will always be entities and experiences and recognitions of properties and characteristics that will call forth in us a sense that, wow, man, this is really important. We need to protect and be respectful here, right? Like the rock in the fumarole, right? Any other rock, you know, you're stumbling all over the place, you know, on the bottom of the lake or, or the stream or what have you. You know, it doesn't matter if the rocks move around with, as you step, right? But in those fumaroles, they have a special little ecosystem right there, and so you want to... Anyway, right, so normally we're not even thinking, right? But once we start thinking about those rocks in that fumarole, new obligations emerge, right? And Rolston would not have been able to make sense of those new obligations, right? He might have made sense of some indirect obligation we have to those rocks, but not direct obligations. Anyway, so, uh, so Thomas Birch just wants to leave it open, right? He wants to leave, leave open the possibility of deontic experience in relationship to all manner of different entities, right, that you might encounter. Climate systems, and not close it off, right? Not close it off. Not close off deontic experience. Which is a project of the Imperium, right? That's the, the 2,000 year old project of, of, of conquering the Earth. Like, how old is this project? I don't know. It's an old human project, trying to conquer the Earth. And sadly and strangely enough, Thomas Birch thinks that much of the way we have conceived our obligations in the 20th century has been driven by this same kind of Imperial mentality. And that's kind of dangerous, right? We want to pay attention. If that's really what's going on, then, wow, a lot of these Sierra Club people, you know, maybe they're part of the problem then. All right. Um, okay, and Thomas Birch says that um, new obligations emerge from the simple act of paying attention, okay? And so, the first rule for Thomas Birch's ethic is respect. And respect is, is just a, a, a way of being in the world. A way of being in the world that involves paying attention to uh, the possibility of having something to care about. All right. Um, and so these, these are three 19th century all three of these are major developments in Western philosophy, right? Major new schools of philosophy, and they all emerged contemporaneously in the second half of the 19th century. Uh, and for all three of these new schools of moral philosophy, human sense and reason are capable of understanding interrelationships among events as well as the events themselves. Some of our interrelationships with more than human entities have moral dimensions insofar as what we do to them affects their interests, our interests, or the interests of the various other species and individual lives that depend on them. Remember William James' account. And really all three of these schools of thought are going to be very suspicious of the kind of meta-ethical distinctions that we've been covering all term long. And, um, and this, this, the distinctions, for example, between instrumental and intrinsic, the distinctions uh, between those entities which have moral agency and those which do not. Uh, okay. Um, all right. And their, uh, their meta ethic is uh, obviously very different than um, the, the meta ethic that all three of these schools of thought 
accept is very different than the objectivist meta-ethic that Rolston accepts. Um, for all three of these schools of thought, William James gives us the best account of what it means to make a moral claim. Okay? Moral claims can only be made by beings with interest, beings who care about what happens to them. A moral claim can exist only where there is a being with interest, a being who must obtain a certain result. And the more, right, the more this must is underlined, the stronger their moral claim is going to be. Right? For things like this, nourishment and hydration, those are the most important, most necessary needs of all, right? So their moral claims to, to those needs being fulfilled are very, very strong, right? Whereas your moral claim to eating meat, the taste of meat, for example, is very weak, right, compared to the moral claim of that animal to his or her life. All right, um, so it seems as though following environmental pragmatism, too, would uh, result in uh, being a vegetarian or a vegan, perhaps, I don't know. Can philosophy really have make that deep a change in a person? That's the whole idea, I think. Mm -hmm. Took me a long time to finally become a vegetarian, though. But I'm a lot happier as being a vegetarian. Anyway. But yeah. Yeah, it seems that, you know, once, once we accept I mean, even William James on this account, it seems like, I don't know if he ever thought about vegetarianism, but he had all kinds of physical problems. He might have been helped by being a vegetarian. But anyway, uh, it didn't occur to him, right, that, that the moral claims that an, a non-human being can make uh, are that important, I guess. So he didn't really think about the steak that he was eating. Um, all right, and then these are the kind of questions that if we can't answer these questions, yes, these three down here, these sets of questions, if we can't say yes to these kinds of questions here, then perhaps the environmental pragmatist has to acknowledge with the conservationist that the notion of uh, obligation to species just doesn't make any sense. And that would have a big impact, perhaps, on, on, on how we treat endangered species, too. Uh, does a species have vital interests? Does a bio community make moral claims? Does a bio community have vital interests? Does an ecosystem, right? Species, bio community, right? wildlife communities, ecosystems, do those things make moral claims? Does Earth as a whole make moral claims? Does Earth, does Earth have vital interests? And perhaps the easier it is to, to answer these questions, yes, the easier it is to, to think of ourselves as having moral obligations. So you can think of, right, some oil company executive with a very administrative, very scientific view of Earth, right? Just flatly denying all of these, answering no to all of these questions, right? And how are we going to say that that oil company executive is wrong? I don't know. But I, you know, I myself, I find it difficult to, to, to think of a species, a genetic lineage, as not making moral claims. Uh, does a species strive to keep itself in being? If we follow Rolston, the answer to that is yes, clearly yes. All of the adjustments that it makes from generation, that it makes, what a strange way of speaking too. We attribute agency. Now we're attributing agency to, to Mount St. Helens. Did you guys notice that? The news, news reports say that, that there are all these earthquakes, swarms of earthquakes around, but you can't detect them, they're tiny, right? But it's because the geologists tell us that the volcano is recharging its magma. That's a very odd way of speaking, right? I mean, the volcano's not doing anything, right? And, and this is an odd way of speaking, too. What do you mean? It's, how could that, how can you make sense of that? A species strives to keep it, there's nothing doing any striving, like with the volcano, right? The volcano isn't actively doing anything. This is something happening to the volcano, right? Anyway, it's recharging. Did you realize it lost 1,300 feet of altitude? That's a lot of altitude. Wow, it would have been cool to climb that mountain before the volcano, before it erupted, right? And you would have been higher. Now you climb it, right? You know, we're near, near as high as you were in 1979 before it blew up. 
Anyway, the volcano is, we speak this way all the time, and perhaps that's why we make some of these metaphysical errors, right? The, the volcano is recharging its magma. Okay, so the volcano is an entity. Now we've got to respect the volcano. The volcano has moral status, right? I mean, that's the source of all these bizarre metaphysical commitments and claims that these objectivists are making, right? It's easier, right? If you think there's something there, then okay, it's thriving. But, but what is that exactly doing the striving? I don't know. This is something happening to the species, right? So it's, it seems like an odd way of thinking. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. If the answers to the four preceding questions are yes, then perhaps it makes sense to speak of these different entities, right? Species, biocommunities, ecosystems, earth is making moral claims. If the answers to the four preceding questions are yes, in other words, then perhaps the needs of ecological wholes should be factored in to the moral calculations of resource managers from an environmental pragmatist perspective, right? That's the whole point of this page of notes, right? Obviously, if you come from a Rolstonian perspective, then this is all a no-brainer, right? Obviously, you have to take you have to consider the needs of species and ecosystems and the earth as a whole. And they are making moral claims, right? From Rolston's point of view. But from the pragmatist point of view, you know, that's that hasn't been determined yet, whether they're making moral claims or not, right? And uh, you know, the metaphysical commitments we might have to make are might be too too big for those guys, you know. So I don't know, I'm starting to think that these different traditions point to obligations, right? Different kinds of obligations to different kinds of entities. And perhaps environmental pragmatism cannot explain that we have direct obligations, but we certainly have a whole bunch of indirect obligations to species. Um, so I don't know. There's a lot more work to be done, obviously, in all of these traditions. Okay, but reading pra environmental pragmatism charitably, we can distinguish it from conservationism, okay? Conservationists believe that we can identify, that we ought to, that there's nothing else we can do. That right natural resource policy should, policy should be identified with reference to the felt preferences of all the affected people. So what do most people want? Well, that's how we ought to organize our natural resource policies, right? And if people want cheap hydro power, if they want cheap forests, then we probably ought to keep these uh, dams in place. And that reminds me, actually, too. Um, okay, yeah, and we'll take a break in a minute, because I think this is a review. I think I went over this last week, too. Um, uh, but um, I would like to, uh, before we take a break here, just uh, think about our final exam. And uh, um, we have an essay, too. Okay. And, and I think I'm supposed to give you guys topics, right, for the essay? This week? Does it say in the syllabus when I'm supposed to give you guys your topics? I think it said two weeks before All right. it's due or something. Um, and then for the final exam, um, I'd like to give students a, a, a choice to either do a written take-home final exam that would be on the same topic. Uh, I mean, that would... That would be, uh, or I would probably give you a variety of different topics, but it would, be, it would be similar. The format would be like the midterm format, okay? But last term, about two-thirds of the students in my class chose to do this kind of group project that involved a mock, we did a mock hearing. We did a, you know, like mock United Nations, stuff like that. You did, might have done that in high school or heard about it, right, where you do these or model United Nations, right? You, you kind of pretend like you're, what we did was we pretended that we were doing a hearing on the proposed oil terminal at the port of Vancouver, right? You guys know about this, right? This giant oil terminal, it's gonna be the largest oil terminal in North America. It's, uh, it's, it hasn't been approved yet, but a lot of the work toward eventually getting it approved has been done, and uh, it's an ongoing debate. It's been going on for a while now. There, steadily moving, but if it's built, if it's approved and built, it'll be the largest oil terminal in North America, and it's, what it is, it's a rail-to-ship oil terminal, right? And they want to they bring the fracked crude oil from the Bakken Shale in North Dakota by rail, by trains, right? They want to bring that fracked oil all the way to Vancouver, and the, the last 200 miles or so of its journey on those rails 
is going to go right down the Columbia Gorge. I think they, they'll send it over the Rocky Mountains and then probably right at Tri-Cities around Richland, Pasco, Kennewick. They'll go along the Columbia River. And then they'll follow the Columbia River all the way to Vancouver, Washington. And then that oil, and that it'll basically quadruple the number of oil trains that they already have on, on the tracks. Right? Right? They've already, they're already doing this, but not on such a large scale. Anyway, uh, and then the oil gets put on oil tankers. And now Congress, thankfully, to the oil companies, they're very grateful that Congress lifted the ban on crude oil exports. And so now they can take fracked oil from, that's their goal, right? They want to take fracked oil from North Dakota all the way to Vancouver, Washington, and then put it on these oil tankers and send it off to Asia and sell it on the open market, right? And they want to put our lands, our entire north and pretty much half of our continent at risk of some catastrophic accident right uh, so that they can make a killing off of uh, selling this our, again our minerals on the open market uh, and they want to use they want to make this giant anyway so we did this mock hearing right and I'm thinking I would like to do a mock hearing on some other uh, some other hypothetical proposition and so how many people would be interested in and, and the way that mock hearing would take place is that basically there would be two sides, right? There would be a pro and a con, right? And each side would have 10 or 15 or 20 people in it, right? And you'd have coordinators, a couple coordinators who would put it up, you know, help people organize. And then, you, and then it would basically be like a hearing, right? Where people would testify. And I would be the, I would play the role of the person who is the, in, in last term, I was Governor Inslee. I was Governor Jay Inslee. He is the guy that has. To, he is the guy that has to make the decision about this oil terminal in Vancouver. Anyway, but um, I, I thought it would be. I don't know. You know, there are a lot of ideas. If I was to say, if I was to choose my moral struggle to have that, I would like to do something like a mock hearing about it. it would be about Salilo Falls, which we haven't really spoken that much about. But proposal to uh, to uh, to remove the Dalles Dam, or at least lower it to restore Salilo Falls. Maybe we shouldn't, I don't know. But I'm thinking we'll pick a moral struggle. And, and, and so those of you who want to do a written final exam will still have that as an option. Some people want to do a written final exam. They just want to consolidate what they've learned you know, in the privacy of their own home and study and do a written. But a lot of people enjoy working with groups, and a lot of people want to do. So I'm just kind of putting it out there right now that, uh, but I don't know what the focus of our mock hearing will be. I don't know, you know, exactly. I mean, we could do the Snake River dams. Maybe that's what we should do. We should do snake lower, the four lower Snake River dams removal, proposal to remove the four lower Snake River dams. Does that sound exciting? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then, and then I get a cup, you know, like three or four, probably four people, I don't know. There'd be someone in charge of each group, you know, so there'd be two people really important. And then you'd have your little deputies, and anyway, you break up into groups. And the way they did it last term was the side that, that was arguing in favor of this oil terminal, they just had various members of their group testify in favor of, you know, building this oil terminal. And they, had, they did things like they had one, one person was a single mother of four kids who really needed a job, you know, and she, and she was really excited about this oil terminal because there was going to be work finally in her community. Anyways, right? And that would be the basic idea is that the pro, like the people who want to keep the four lower snake dams in place would present testimony you know, for all, all kinds of different reasons why this idea of removing those dams is just ridiculous and we just need to keep, right? And then the environmental community, would, and there would be different elements, right? There'd be more than anthropocentric environmentalists, and then the, right? The, in the environmental community, the different points of view that we've been studying all term long would also be represented. And then, and then that's how it works, is that, you know, there'd be different people presenting testimony. And you would all, contribute, right, to the preparation. You would meet, you'd meet with each other in, in groups, right, outside of class, and you'd contribute to the preparation, but not all of you would be expected to talk, right? So anyway, that's kind of how I envision our, our one option for our final exam. So I'm going to have to put my uh, thinking cap on and uh, try to get this a little organized, and then probably at the beginning of next week, I'll, I'll uh, have it finalized, okay? And then you guys can, and then it's up, it'll be up to you guys to start preparing for it, okay? Does that sound all right? Mm -hmm.
And, and, the, and this mock hearing that I'm talking about, this little pretend deal, would happen right here in this room, and it will happen on the day at the, in the time slot that, I, that we have designated for our final exam, okay? So I know some people want to get out of here early and start your summer vacation. Those people, you're welcome to do your written final exam, and then you can get out of here, right? But those of you who want to do this group project, it's, I think it's scheduled for a Thursday, isn't it? That's kind of aggravating, isn't it? For a commuter school, it should be aggravating. I mean, you're supposed to stick around. It's your education, right? But a lot of people just want to, anyway, commuter school type values. So let's take a four minute break and then let's come back to uh, some more environmental pragmatism and then let's get on to uh, some more uh, salmon stuff. All right, so come back at 10 after one. Sorry, oh, sorry. I have to ask Yeah. Are you Steve Even though he was teaching at a at a different school, uh, 
when I wrote my dissertation at the University of Oregon, um, they, they wanted somebody who was an expert in environmental ethics. So uh, I had never met him, though, interestingly enough. I just talked to him on the phone, and he gave, had made his contributions to my dissertation. I got to know him a, just a little bit. Um, but he and, and Brian Norton are, the two, are two very prominent environmental pragmatists. Uh, and, uh, but but they, they embrace dramatically different axiological orientations. Norton is happy identifying as an anthropocentrist, calls himself a weak anthropocentrist. Um, Weston, however, rejects uh, the whole um, Cartesian, really, uh, all these, these the dualistic meta-ethic that um, Norton seems to be content with uh, Weston rejects, he rejects all the kinds of distinctions that are reflected in my chart, okay? Um, he acknowledges that, yes, we are human beings in human bodies with human minds, and we have it, an essentially human, we always, there's no escaping our human outlook on the world, right? And our human interest in what we're thinking about. But um, the human mind is perfectly capable, nevertheless, of recognizing and locating centers of value in non-human animals, species, and ecosystems. All right, and, and, and perhaps the work of Rolston helps us to identify centers of value in these other kinds of entities, right? Perhaps Regan's work helps us to identify centers of value in, in non-human animals, and then Rolston's work helps us to identify centers of value in species and ecosystems. But the point is, our minds, despite you know being locked into our human bodies, our minds have, and perhaps you know there's a, there's a simple word that I've used before to describe this capability, and the simple word is compassion, right? We that's not just a matter of uh, of having your heart go out, right? That's part of compassion. Obviously, your heart goes out to somebody. You're feeling compassion for that person, for that being, even if it's not a person, right? Uh, but it also involves being able to take the viewpoint of, right? Compassion involves being able to take the viewpoint of another entity. And, and that's what, the, and we have that capability, right? We, we can take, right? When you see the neighbor dumping out his, what, his used motor oil or something around the, around the tree down the street or something, you can feel this, you know, right? If you're a sensitive, many sensitive people can feel that that tree is not happy at all. And you can take the view of a tree with simple things like that, right? Um, so that indicates that uh, we can conceive of beings other than humans as centers of value. Right? Um, and we don't experience these the kinds of distinctions that uh, Rolston and Kalika uh, make a lot out of. Weston denies that we even experience those distinctions. We don't experience values as either instrumental or intrinsic. Rather, we experience webs of values, which are only separable into categories retroactively and abstractly. Okay? We don't experience intrinsic values. Um, all right? We do experience, uh, well, okay, I think on the next slide. All right, anyway, moving on here.